Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, and just to say, as many of us are aware, today is a day of, of action by scientists around the world. And I wanted to say that uh, it gives me a great pleasure to do this today, but uh, this will be my only main scientific activity of the day because we organized it before and I know many people have subscribed to this. So uh, we should remember what today is for many scientists around the world. Thank you. So, um, yes, we have um, this introduction here. I, I, current issues, as you've explained, in middle to late Pleistocene human evolution. The story seems at times to get increasingly complex. I think in some issues we have greater clarity, but in many issues there is still a lot we don't understand. And I think it's important to remember how much we don't understand. So this is a diagram from a paper I co-authored last year. And a diagram like this, maybe 10 years ago, I would have been connecting up many of these different lineages and species in evolutionary relationships with a lot of confidence now a lot of that confidence is gone and we see that uh, there are only a few tentative connections on this diagram between these different lineages and species. But I will try and talk about most of these today, uh, in some cases more briefly than others. So one thing we can be pretty sure about is that maybe only 70,000 years ago, so yesterday, geologically speaking, there were at least five kinds of humans around on the earth. We Homo sapiens had been evolving in Africa. The Neanderthals had been evolving in Europe and Asia. Down over on the island of Flores in Indonesia, this strange species, Homo floresiensis, had been evolving for a long period of time, apparently. On Luzon in the Philippines, there is a recently announced species, Homo luzonensis. And in Siberia, we have these people, the Denisovans, which again, we only learnt about in the last 10 years or so. And you can see I've got question marks over these reconstructions of Denisovans and luzonensis, because we still have a lot to learn uh, about those two groups in particular. And of course, it's possible that Homo erectus also survived into that time period, in which case there would have been at least six kinds of humans around 70,000 years ago. But by the time we come to 30,000 years ago or so, we lose sight physically of all of those other kinds of humans. And as far as we know, Homo sapiens was the only surviving human species. And one of the big issues is, why was that? Why did those other species disappear and we took over the, the world for, for better or worse? So first of all, we'll look at this issue of the last common ancestor of Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. And this is a question I've worked on for 
much of my scientific career. And for most of my career, I've worked on this idea that uh, in the middle Pleistocene, there was an ancestral species for the Neanderthals and modern humans. And that ancestral species was probably Homo heidelbergensis, a species that in my view was widespread about 500,000 years ago. And I used to think it provided a good model for the common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans. So in the face, for example, I could see the Heidelbergensis face as being sort of midway between the two very different facial shapes we find in the Neanderthals and modern humans. So in Neanderthals, the middle of the face is pulled very far forwards. The nose is very large and the cheekbones are inflated, puffed out. Whereas in modern humans, the middle of the face is very much flatter transversely flat, retracted, and the cheekbones are often hollowed with a canine fossa. So for me, Heidelbergensis represented a sort of intermediate, and evolution could have gone in one direction towards the Neanderthal face, and in the other direction towards the face we find in modern humans. So this is the kind of model that I've really argued for over the last, well, 40 years or so, really, there's Heidelbergensis as the potential common ancestor for modern humans, Neanderthals, also for Denisovans, Homo antecessor, an earlier species known only from uh, Atapuerca in Spain, um, is regarded as a side branch, not potentially part of our ancestry. However, things are getting more complicated in that story. So here's some work I was involved in, which we published uh, last year. And here we were looking at the facial shape um, of humans through time. And you can see here two fossils from the late, late early Pleistocene and the early middle Pleistocene, one of them from Grandolina, Atapuerca, type specimen for this species, Homo antecessor, about 850,000 years old. And here a fossil from Nanjing in China, about 600,000 years old. But the facial form of these two examples in the middle of the face is actually very like that of modern humans, very like that of Homo sapiens. A transversely flat face and rather delicately built cheekbones. So this is very strange to have fossils which are potentially older than many Heidelbergensis fossils um, and yet show a more apparently modern looking face. And the situation continues when we move later in the middle Pleistocene. So at the top here, we have the fossils from China, from Dali uh, and the newly announced one from Harbin. At the bottom, we have one of the Sima de los Huesos fossils from Atapuerca and the Broken Hill skull from Zambia. And as I say here, in terms of the facial shape, despite the very wide noses, um, Dali and Harbin are more like Homo sapiens and more like the Hulu and Grandolina fossils than they are like Sima or Heidelbergensis fossils. So again, in China, in the Middle Pleistocene, we have a face that looks more modern, in a sense, more sapiens-like. And when we look further at that material from the Cima del Huesos, obviously a huge collection, many thousands of fossils, at least 28 individuals. And it's been recognized for a long time that the morphology of this collection of fossils in some ways is quite Neanderthal-like. So we have there on the right-hand side one of the Sema skulls and a skull, the back of a skull from Swanscombe in England. And at the back of the skull, these fossils show features we find later on in the Neanderthals. And the teeth of the Sema people in particular are very Neanderthal-like. And yet this sample is dated now at around 430,000 years old. And it even has DNA. Uh, a femur fragment from the Sema human sample uh, 
has been sampled and the genomic data from it shows that this population was pretty certainly on the Neanderthal lineage. So we have early Neanderthals, or at least early members of the Neanderthal lineage around in Europe about 430,000 years ago. And the situation is even more complicated in Europe uh, because we see that around that time, we actually have morphologies in Europe which, as we've said, do look Neanderthal-like in the Sema at Atapuerca, at Swanscombe, and at the other extreme, we have fossils which seem more Heidelbergensis-like, uh, more primitive in some respects. And we can think of Bilsingsleben, Malabalanica, the material from Arago, the Soprano skull from Italy, much more Heidelbergensis-like, and yet all living within maybe 50,000 years of each other. And then we have a fossil from Portugal, Aurora, which in some ways shows those uh, a mixed morphology between those two groups. So there seems to be an overlap in Europe of a Heidelbergensis-like morphology and a Neanderthal-like morphology. And that situation probably also applies in Africa, and I'll talk a bit more about this later, but uh, not too long ago I was a co-author on this paper about the dating of the Broken Hill Skull, and as it says there, the age estimate for that fossil now is about 299,000 years old. And as it says there in the abstract, this age estimate raises further questions about the mode of evolution of Homo sapiens in Africa and whether Heidelbergensis was a direct ancestor of our species. So this is the more complex situation now. In the middle there, we have the Sema fossils, apparently clearly Neanderthal-like in some features, at least 400,000 years old. Um, and the common ancestor of us and Neanderthals may be being pushed back towards 700,000 years ago. Some people would place it even earlier. And that does raise question marks then about the role of Heidelbergensis in our evolution and the fact that actually in facial shape, something like Homo antecessor seems to be more like the uh, ancestral shape for Homo sapiens and also then for Neanderthals. So this would mean that Neanderthals moved away from the ancestral face shape and we actually kept that face from the common ancestor we shared maybe 600,000 years ago. Heidelbergensis also moved away from that ancestral facial shape. So the face we call modern, in fact, is primitive. It was there in populations widely dispersed in Europe and Asia um, about eight, seven or 800,000 years ago. So much more doubt now uh, about our common ancestor. <clears throat> and that's why in that diagram on the right, I've termed the ancestor, ancestor X, because I think we don't know now which was the most likely common ancestor for us and the Neanderthals, potentially also then for the Denisovans. So having mentioned the Denisovans, let's take a look at this group that we've only learnt about in the last 10 years or so, the Denisovans. So of course, uh, Russian scientists have been, archaeologists have been excavating the Denisova cave for about 50 years. Um, and it's a rich site, rich fauna, rich archaeology, and of course, a few human specimens. The teeth from Denisova Cave were large, but it was unknown what kind of human they represented. In some respects, people suspected they were even Homo erectus-like, based on just the teeth. But of course, in 2010, uh, work showed that the DNA of one of the specimens, a, a part of a finger bone from Denisova Cave, represented not a Neanderthal, not a modern human, something distinct that we now call Denisovans. And work in the cave has shown that there's a deep stratigraphy in several chambers going back hundreds of thousands of years, and that we not only have Denisovan-like fossils in that stratigraphy back to at least 150,000 years, but Neanderthals were there at times as well. So this is a fascinating site 
uh, a tremendous amount of information coming out of this site now. So here's a sample of some of the human material from Denisova Cave. So we can see at the top there, specimens assigned on their DNA to the Denisovan group. And there's also some skull fragments now to be added to that. And then we have below some Neanderthal-like fossils, which have Neanderthal DNA. And even, of course, Denisova 11, which appears to be a first-generation hybrid of a mating between a Neanderthal and a Denisovan. So an extraordinary find from Denisova Cave. So quite unexpected until recently that there was this completely distinct population living over in Siberia. But morphologically, of course, from this data, we can't build up much of a picture of what the Denisovans look like. But we had more information arriving with this uh, fascinating jawbone from the Tibetan plateau of China from Xiaohe. So this jawbone has been dated to at least 160,000 years old. It has very large teeth with rather complex morphology of the crowns and roots, and in that sense, Denisovan-like. And this was accentuated and confirmed by a little bit of proteomic material, which also allied this jawbone to the Denisovan group rather than to Neanderthals or modern humans. So this could well be a Denisovan jawbone from the Tibetan Plateau of China, at least 160,000 years old. So it shows us this jawbone is very robust. Uh, again, rather big and archaic looking teeth. Uh, no sign of a chin at the front of that jawbone. And when we look at the teeth, of course, we can say something about their affinity because we think of the Sema teeth. I've mentioned already the Atapuerca Sema teeth show many Neanderthal affinities. The Denisovan teeth and the ones in the Zahe mandible show few, if any, real Neanderthal resemblances. So the teeth already are quite distinct from those of Neanderthals. So what about other material in China? Since the Xiaohe mandible seems to be Denisovan-like, at least in its proteomics and its teeth, um, well, I think that China probably showed quite a lot of diversity in the past. We have the Marpa skull, for example, and I think a number of us now are noting that it does actually look a bit Neanderthal-like in some respects. So could this be evidence of an early Neanderthal from China, from Marpa? The Pengu mandible from uh, found off Taiwan, um, this mandible shows a number of resemblances to the one from Xiaohe. So could this be also then a Denisovan jawbone? And then we have fossils like Dali, Harbin, and Zhu Jiao Yao. And we simply don't know their resemblances at the moment, but at least there's the possibility that those fossils could be Denisovan. Um, I think diversity in China is something that we still have a very poor idea of, and it may be that uh, there actually were several lineages in China in the middle and early late Pleistocene, and this still has to be untangled from the data Hopefully there will be some ancient DNA to come from this material. And if not, maybe proteomic material can help us identify the relationships of some of these very important Chinese fossils. So it looks likely based on the primitive mandible morphology and dental morphology that we have now for the Denisovans, that the Denisovan lineage probably diverged from the Neanderthal lineage prior to the time of the SEMA sample, because that SEMA sample shows clear Neanderthal features, particularly in the teeth. We don't find those in the Denisovan teeth and the Ziahe mandible. So it's likely that the Denisovans diverged before the time of the SEMA people, which would be then before 430,000 years ago. And of course, we have information about the Denisovans uh, 
in modern human populations because not only do populations outside of Africa show evidence of interbreeding with Neanderthals, but many of them also show interbreeding evidence with the Denisovans. There is Denisovan-like DNA in many populations in Asia, in the Americas, and particularly down towards Australasia. And the suggestion is from the genetic data that first of all, there was interbreeding with Neanderthals, and then we would guess that populations of modern humans moved across Asia, and then somewhere in Asia, maybe in more than one region, there was interbreeding with the Denisovans, and that DNA carries on to the present day. So we can build up a tentative network of relationships of the Denisovans. So as we mentioned on the fossil morphology, we can show that the Denisovan teeth bear resemblances to the teeth in the Ziahe mandible, and also then through the Ziahe mandible, a relationship with the Pengu mandible from uh, off Taiwan. Possibly the Zhujiao Yao teeth show Denisovan-like features. So we can begin to build up a network of possible relationships. And then in DNA today, Yes, we find specific Denisovan-like genes in populations, for example, in the Americas, to do with uh, the accumulation of body, of particular kinds of body fat. And some individuals, some populations in Tibet show signs of De Denisovan introgression through the EPAS1 gene, which helps these populations live at high altitude. And then down in Southeast Asia, particularly as we approach Papua New Guinea and Australia, we find increased levels of Denisovan integration, but what seems to be a distinct kind of Denisovan, not one that was genetically identical with the individuals living in Denisova Cave. So where did those southern Denisovans live? Well, there are many possibilities, of course, in that region down south. Um, and so if we look now at some of the possibilities, well, we've got Homo floresiensis on Flores, but this seems to be a long and deep lineage going back probably at least a million years on the island of Flores. So there seems no likelihood that, that uh, the Flores individual is a Denisovan. And equally we have this primitive species, still rather poorly known from the Philippines, from Luzon, Homo luzonensis. And again, this shows some really archaic features which hark back to at least the time of Homo erectus, uh, possibly even further back. So it seems likely that luzonensis too is a deep local lineage, unlikely to be a Denisovan. And particularly those teeth, of course, from Luzon look very unlike those from Denisova Cave. And on Java, we again, we seem to have a long local lineage lasting for more than a million years. So it seems unlikely that these Homo erectus individuals, even the late ones known from, for example, the Solo River, are Denisovans. So that makes it more likely for me that the southern Denisovans were living in regions like Sumatra, Borneo, Sulawesi. And so those are the areas where I think we can look forward to hopefully finding fossil evidence which may turn out eventually to belong to these southern Denisovan populations. And of course workers like Jacobs and colleagues have analyzed the Denisovan DNA found in Denisova cave and present in modern day populations. And they argue that there were potentially at least three Denisovan populations, which were splitting up some of them more than 300,000 years ago. So it seems that the Denisovans contained a lot of genetic diversity, much more than we find in Neanderthals, um, and that the introgression shows us signals of introgression from these distinct Denisovan populations. How different they were morphologically from each other, of course, we have no idea at the moment. <laughs>
So let's now turn to Homo sapiens origins and early dispersers of Homo sapiens from Africa. So, of course, we have this wonderful work on the Jebel Ihud site from Morocco. Of course, the original Jebel Ihud one skull, uh, known from the 1960s, but only recently have we got a real fix on its uh, position in human evolution in terms of its, its dating and also detailed study of the archaeology from uh, Jebel Ihud, this, these beautiful early Middle Stone Age tools which can now be dated to around 300,000 years ago. So just as the semen material seems to represent a very early Neanderthal lineage members in Europe uh, at over 400,000 years ago, it looks like Jebel Ihud could be on the early Sapiens lineage from Africa um, at about 300,000 years ago. However, the overall African picture is a complex one. So as I say here, we have African and Israeli sapiens fossils shown here in this diagram, dating from around 300,000 years ago to about 100,000 years ago. They show high variation, and it's difficult to discern a clear pattern of change towards modern humans through time in this sample. Now, that may be that the sample is still poorly dated, and if we had better dating on these fossils, maybe they would show a more orderly sequence of evolution towards the modern human morphology. But it doesn't look like that uh, overall. And this is a diagram from work by Philip Guntz, which is kindly letting me show. Um, even even Jebel Ehud 1 uh, is not, clearly uh, a sapiens in some respects. So here is an analysis of the scanning of the Jebel Ihud 1 skull compared with the skulls of Neanderthals, Hydrobagensis, Sema 5, and a large sample of modern humans. And you can see there that uh, Shkul 5 and Kafse, for example, fall nicely really into the sapiens morphology. So this principal component too is really related to the globularity of the skull. So the skulls at the bottom of this uh, principal component analysis on, on principal component two are long and low, and we would call archaic. The ones at the top show the modern human globular skull shape. But you can see, I hope, that Jebel Ihud 1 there is much closer to the Neanderthals in its cranial shape. So the face of Ihud 1 is certainly sapiens-like but overall in brain case shape, it's still very Neanderthal-like. And if we try to make some sort of categorization of these fossils based on globularity, then yes, school five and Kafse fall into the sapiens morphology, but Ehud actually is much closer to archaic humans in its brain case shape. Now, is that just because it's a very ancient sapiens fossil and the modern brain case shape uh, had not yet evolved. That is certainly a possibility. But we also have to bear in mind the possibility that trying to categorize, you know, the, the African fossils as being clearly on the Sapiens lineage 300,000 years ago, again, may be oversimplifying what was going on in Africa. And we have to remember that Africa, although it's produced some wonderful fossils from South Africa, from the East African Rift Valley sites, from caves in sites like Morocco, more than 90% of the continent has still not produced any significant fossils for the Middle Pleistocene and the Early Late Pleistocene. So even though archaeology is there, we know people were living there, we have no idea what they look like, what species they represented. And that we're reminded of that by the Broken Hill Skull, the fact that this Heidelbergensis fossil, which many people estimated at about 500,000 years old, is, is in fact around 300,000 years old. And that means that around 300,000 years ago, even in Africa, we had three different kinds of humans around. We had uh, the Ehud fossils, which may represent Homo sapiens up in the northwest, we have Broken Hill, 
uh, in Zambia. And down south, of course, we have Homo naledi, uh, an even more primitive species, still around apparently around 300,000 years ago. So there is this greater complexity that we're learning about, even in Africa. And that complexity goes on into the late Pleistocene because I and colleagues have worked on this skull from Nigeria, from Iwo Aleru, dated only to about 13,000 years old. And yet it shows a, a much more archaic morphology. In my view, it is a Homo sapiens fossil, but it's certainly very unusual and very unlike any, much, any more recent African populations. So I think it gives us a clue of what we're missing in the fossil record from Central and West Africa in particular, there may have been distinct populations living there that we have only a very poor fix on at the moment. So the situation in Africa seems to be a much more complex one. And this is a quote from uh, Ellie Sherry. Humans did not stem from a single ancestral population in one region of Africa, as is often claimed. Instead, our African ancestors were diverse in form and culture and scattered across the entire continent. So we actually have a network of interbreeding populations through time in the middle Pleistocene of Africa. At times, these populations were isolated from each other uh, in, in times of bad uh, climate, um, groups going extinct at times. At other times, groups enlarged and contacted each other for example, when the Sahara was, uh, was, was relatively humid, when there were networks of lakes and rivers, these populations expanded into those areas and came into contact with each other. So the evolution of modern humans in Africa was not a single lineage in one place. It was actually a network of evolving populations. So what about the exodus from Africa? Well, again, this story gets increasingly complex. Um, Ten years ago, I would have said, well, essentially, there was one exit around uh, 50 or 60,000 years ago, and that gave rise to all of the populations outside of Africa. But it certainly looks more complex from that now. For example, from the presence of what seem to be uh, early modern human fossils in China that are at least 80,000 years old. So we see the arrival in Europe also being pushed back by this recent publication of material from Bacho Kiro in Bulgaria. And here we have uh, some fragmentary fossils, uh, including a molar tooth with mitochondrial DNA, which is modern human-like, and this material with initial upper Paleolithic artifacts dated to at least 45,000 years ago in Bulgaria. So we seem to have the movement of modern humans a bit earlier into Europe and possibly from Epidema in Greece, even earlier arrivals of early Homo sapiens. So this fossil, Epidema 1, um, it's been known for many years, but we published a paper on it last year, which argued that the Epidema 2 fossil was an early Neanderthal, but within the breccia in the cave, there was this distinct back of a skull Epidema 1, which actually was much more like that of Homo sapiens. So we've got a comparison here from that paper showing you the back of the Epidema 1 skull. It is only the back of a skull, so we, we can't say what the whole morphology was like. But that back of skull is much more like an early sapiens fossil like School 5, down on the bottom right there. It's much more like the School 5 occipital shape then it's like a Neanderthal shape or a Heidelbergensis shape. So if this is an arrival of Homo sapiens in, in Europe, it's arriving more than 200,000 years ago. This may only be a brief episodic movement of modern humans out of Africa more than 200,000 years ago. But of course, it does raise the possibility that that dispersal didn't just come into Europe. Perhaps it also went to the east as well. And of course, it, it even might raise questions about who was making some of the archaeology in Europe more than 200,000 years ago. We've got this uh, fantastically complex structure from Brunico Cave dated around 175,000 years ago. 
Now, it's very likely that this structure was made by Neanderthals, but the presence of the Epidema fossil in Greece uh, over 200,000 years ago means we, we have to keep at least a tiny bit of doubt because there must be some evidence if that Epidema fossil really does represent a sapiens dispersal into Europe at least 200,000 years ago, then somewhere there should be archaeological data relevant to that dispersal of Homo sapiens into Europe. And then on the other side of the inhabited world, we have the evidence from Australia of apparently uh, an arrival of, of a human population in northwestern Australia with what we would call modern human behavior in terms of the complexity, in terms of the, the artifacts, in terms of the level of symbolism represented, dated to at least 65,000 years ago. So this is very challenging. Again, the genetic data for this region would suggest that modern humans arrived in the region less than 60,000 years ago as part of a wider dispersal. And yet here we've got evidence apparently of Homo sapiens-like behavior in Northern Australia at least 65,000 years ago. So this is a challenging find again, uh, challenges this idea that there was only one single significant dispersal of Homo sapiens. And here's a, a diagram I borrowed from a, a, a discussion piece by Robin Dennell. And here we can see the possibility that there were at least two waves of Homo sapiens dispersal into Asia and Australasia. So the first wave would have been at least 100,000 years ago, and that gets into China, potentially from the evidence from Bebe, it even eventually arrived in Australia. And then we had a second dispersal, the one that is genetically best represented in modern human populations, happening about 60,000 years ago, and that also then moves eventually into the regions in Europe and the Far East. But if this data are correct, then we'd have to argue that that second wave overprints any evidence of that first wave. So either those first wave populations died out, they went extinct, or their signal was erased by the relative success of that second wave of dispersal around 60,000 years ago. Of course, there's another possibility I put at the bottom. Could the genetic calibrations of events be wrong? Could they be too young? Could that second wave actually be older than 60,000 years ago? Well, the geneticists I know tell me that's unlikely, but again, we have to keep a slight doubt about the accuracy of these genetic calibrations. So nearing the end of my presentation now, this tricky question of uh, species. Um, are Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, for example, good species? And this is a tricky question, which is uh, regularly argued about, for example, on Twitter. So uh, we know that genetically modern humans and Neanderthals are closely related. Even if we diverged 600,000 years ago, that's comparable with the divergence of brown bears and polar bears and those bears can hybridize successfully. Mitochondrial DNA, on the top right, there's a diagram from the mitochondria of Neanderthals showing that they were quite distinct. So the mitochondrial evidence suggested there was no uh, intermixture between modern humans and Neanderthals. But I was aware of the similarities of the population genetically, and so my view down there on the left had been, if there was any interbreeding, it was on such a small scale, we're not going to find any trace of it today. So my view had been, well, it, uh, it wasn't normal behavior for these populations. It may have happened a bit, but with all the changes since, we're very unlikely to find evidence of it today. And yet some people argued, of course, that there was evidence from archaeology of contact between these populations. Uh, some people have argued that the Chateau Peronian industry, for example, is an example of Neanderthals in cultural contact and sharing ideas with modern humans who were uh, living in Europe at the same time. Well, of course, this was settled really uh, from 2010 onwards with the publication of this paper in Science. And here's a commentary 
um, close encounters of the prehistoric kind. The long-awaited sequence of the Neanderthal genome suggests that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred tens of thousands of years ago, perhaps in the Middle East. As a result, well, we can say pretty well everyone living outside Africa has inherited a small but significant amount of DNA from these extinct humans. So this seemed to put the matter to rest. There really had been uh, interbreeding between us and Neanderthals. And of course, soon afterwards, we had the evidence of interbreeding between uh, modern humans and Denisovans as well. So we've had a recent interesting paper uh, by Richard Allen and colleagues, which uses mitochondrial divergences to estimate the genetic compatibility uh, of mammalian populations and the likelihood that they could hybridize. So here's a quote from that paper. Um, and when the distance values between humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans were calculated, they were even smaller than the values between several pairs of species, which are known readily, readily and easily to hybridize, including polar bears and brown bears and coyotes and wolves. Well, we have to be slightly cautious here because if we look at the divergence dates of populations, uh, the Neanderthals and modern humans, it depends which bit of the genome we look at. So here are some quotes from a paper by Post and colleagues in 2017, where the genomic diver diversification of Neanderthals and modern humans began on their estimate, maybe around 650,000 years ago. The Y chromosome, they gave an estimate of around 630,000 years ago. For mitochondrial DNA, the divergence is only around 400,000 years. So it's been known for a while that the mitochondrial DNA of modern humans and Neanderthals is closer than the estimate we would get from the Y chromosome or the genomes. So I think we have to be a little bit careful in just using mitochondrial DNA to estimate compatibility of lineages. But certainly, regardless of all these figures, there's no doubt that we did hybridize successfully with Neanderthals and Denisovans. So why are we still calling them different species? Well, there are clear morphological data that we can apply to this question. So for example, in skull shape, the work of people like Katerina Havati and others since has shown that in terms of skull shape, the Neanderthals are certainly as distinct from us in skull shape as many closely related primate species are uh, from each other in skull shape. And when we look at the middle and inner ear bones, and this is the data on the, the bottom right there, we find that the middle and inner ear bones of Neanderthals and modern humans, in some ways in terms of shape, are more distinct than the inner and middle ear bones of gorillas and chimpanzees. So what I would say, and, and this is a quote from a piece I put on the museum website uh, on this question, are, are Neanderthals the same species as us? In my view, if Neanderthals and Homo sapiens remain separate, separate long enough to evolve such distinctive skull shapes, pelvises and ear bones, they can be regarded as different species, interbreeding or not. Humans are great classifiers and we do like to keep things orderly, but we should not be surprised when the natural world, past and present, does not match up to our neat and simple schemes. So the fact is that it can take one or two million years for mammalian and bird species to evolve full reproductive isolation. If we separated from the Neanderthals maybe 600,000 years ago, clearly that was not long enough to produce reproductive isolation. And is it a, is it a big deal whether we call them a distinct species or not? Well, it's a matter of judgment. Uh, and I prefer to keep them as that category as a separate species but all the time, I have to bear in mind, that does not mean they could not interbreed with each other. So, one of the really big questions, of course, which many of us struggle with is why, why are we the last survivors? Why we, are we the last human group left? And all those other ones went, uh, went extinct. Well, here are some headlines which uh, put forward various ideas. So... Uh, 
Homo sapiens were to blame for Neanderthal extinction because they were better hunters and outcompeted them for, for food, a computer model shows. Uh, down the bottom left there, a new theory claims Homo sapiens beat out the Neanderthals because we had art. Uh, that's certainly a bit questionable now with growing evidence that Neanderthals too uh, produce some forms of art. Uh, humans replaced Neanderthals because we had bows and arrows and they didn't, a study suggests. Well, that's an interesting idea, but of course, the evidence for bows and arrows is, is lacking in the archaeological evidence uh, for most areas uh, until much more recently than the disappearance of the Neanderthals. But maybe there's more new data to come on that. Uh, did Homo sapiens develop a new ecological niche that separated us from other hominins? Um, a new study argues the greatest defining feature of our species is not symbolism or dramatic cognitive change, but rather it's our unique ecological position as a global generalist specialist. So there are some ideas, and of course there are many more. So I think what can we say? about the spread of our species and its success. Well, after 60,000 years ago, we do seem to have grown our numbers and geographical range quite quickly compared with others, such as the Neanderthals. Did we just get lucky? For example, were those other species already in trouble? And there's some evidence, for example, that Neanderthals were low in numbers and low in genetic diversity by the time uh, or close to the time they were going extinct? Or was there something different in our DNA, our bodies, or our behavior? Well, we don't know, but I do think our behavior was a big factor. So this is where the archaeology becomes extremely important. Maybe we networked and accumulated knowledge better, and we learned to extract resources more intensively from the environment than those other humans did. And of course, it's a question not just in explaining the physical disappearance of the Neanderthals, but the disappearance of the Denisovans, for example, who, as we've said, seem to have been um, a successful population that was much higher in probably in numbers and diversity than the Neanderthals were. Why did that species or group also disappear, at least physically, certainly not genetically? Okay, so I'll stop there and I just want to thank uh, all my sources of data and illustrations and the people who've supported my work uh, and to say that uh, uh, there's material uh, that you can look at on the Natural History Museum website and uh, I am active on Twitter as well if you want to find me there. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening.